morning. I always like to take the opportunity on the 4th of July weekend just to remind you that the church is a global church uh, that we are a part of. Uh, Often we tend to think that that God is is closer somehow to us in America, and that is not the case. We we are part of a global church, and we, um, we have Christians from all over the world, and one reason why we you know, we don't put up flags from our nation and things like that in our churches because we are a global church. We have people from all over the world who worship here, and we want to celebrate all of our cultures and all the places that we come from and just honor that this morning. And, and I also just want to say that I heard someone say once that perhaps we should, as Christians, be more apt to celebrate our interdependence over our independence. Um, I think that we as Christians are, are tightly connected to one another. And And while the idea of freedom and independence is wonderful, we have been set free so that we can love one another and be more connected to one another. Um, We are set free for a purpose that is much greater than us. And so uh, I always like to be reminded every year when we come around to this point that that we, uh, freedom is wonderful and we celebrate that, but but no one is free until we're all free. And so we're going to continue to fight for that. And... uh, We also need to be reminded, too, that we are interconnected. I love this uh, African concept that I've I've really leaned into over the years called Ubuntu. I don't know if y'all are familiar with this, but it's this idea that that we are all interconnected, that I am me because you are you, and that we cannot be separated from one another, that, that we are all interwoven, that humanity is deeply connected to one another. And then when we get too like, focused in on our own culture, our own nation, our own ideas of what this world ought to be like, then we forget sometimes that like, we're part of this wonderful fabric uh, of all different types of fabric woven together um, that we call humanity. And God has deep love for all of us. And we want to continue to be people uh, here at this church that try to live that out and represent that in the way we live our lives. And so um, it's just on my heart this morning, just something I wanted to say. I want to share just a little bit this morning, um, and I'm, I'm excited about this message. It, some things have come to me this morning through my reading and study that I'm excited to share with you all. So I want to start by just sharing about something really important that we do every week at our church. On Mondays at 4 o'clock, we gather together right down in our fellowship hall for a time of prayer. And now every Monday, we always have prayer at 4, we have just time of sharing and fellowship, between 4 and 6, we share a meal together at 6 o'clock, and then we worship together after that at 6.45 right here in our sanctuary. And it's a wonderful time. We call it the gathering. You're always invited to come. Um, It's a wonderful group of people from from our community. We got folks who come because they're hungry and want to eat. We have folks who come because they want fellowship. Some folks come because they really want to serve. It's just a really neat group of people. And one thing we started doing a few years ago is we started meeting at four with all of our leaders and anybody who comes early to pray together. And lately I'll say that our prayer time has been, we we do bow our heads and pray and close our eyes and do that kind of thing, but a lot of it recently has been a lot of prayerful conversation. And, And there's different ways to pray. I think when we're having spiritual conversations about deep things, that's a form of prayer. And so lately, we've been having just some really deep, like spiritual, important conversation about things that matter. Lately, some things that have come up in the last few weeks are, we've talked about a lot of hard stuff recently, because there's been a lot of hard things happening, right? We've talked about gun violence, talked about sickness, our fears, the challenges that our young people are facing in our community right now. We've talked about the lack of safe affordable housing that so many people in our community, some of our very folks who are coming on Monday nights cannot find right now. Many of you all may be looking for safe, affordable housing. Talked about broken relationships and dysfunctional government, oppressive policies. You know, one thing I've heard time and time again uh, during our time on Monday nights, and one thing I've just felt is that and, and I think Lawrence even shared this last week, but it feels like there's like this dark cloud like hovering over us right now. Have y'all felt like that at times? Um, if you don't, that's great. Uh, but I've kind of felt like there's this dark cloud that's hovering over us right now. That we're facing really difficult challenges. And we're dealing with some downright like dark and scary stuff right now. Do y'all agree with me about this? Um, And I've been thinking about Jesus a lot this year. We've been spending our year with Jesus. And one thing, I'll just say a couple of things about Jesus because I think it connects to what we're facing now. Jesus lived for about 30 years or so 
Um, some people say 33 years. We don't know exactly how many years he lived. But he lived during the first century. Now, we're talking about 2,000 years ago. This was a really long time ago. Jesus lived in a time that was very, very different from our time today, right? You just go back 100 years and look at the culture, and you go to a museum or something, and looking at artifacts just for the last 100, 200 years, you're like, it's a very different culture back then. Think about 2,000 years ago. Lots of differences. However, there were some things that were very similar that Jesus faced that we face today. Jesus understood this dark cloud that I'm talking about that hovers over us. Because the reality is Jesus faced all the things that we've been talking about on Mondays. They faced violence. They faced sickness, death, fear. Young people were were facing and dealing with the harsh realities of poverty and lack of opportunities. They dealt with safe issues of safe housing, broken relationships, deeply dysfunctional government, oppressive policies. They faced all of it. Jesus also was a poor Jew. He didn't have the privileges and power that was associated with being a Roman citizen during that time. I would guess most of his followers were also poor Jews living under the oppressive rule of the Roman Empire. We live in dangerous times today, and Jesus lived in dangerous times when he was walking the earth. And here's the thing, Jesus didn't run away from the trouble Jesus didn't take his community and establish his little group of people outside of the community, outside, away from the world's problems. No, he lived and worked right in the midst of the suffering and the violence and the hardship. And he also sent out his followers. He had this huge group of people following him. And he sent them out to places where the pain was the deepest, where the most people were neglected, where people were tired and afraid. Jesus sent out these agents of the kingdom to go out to the difficult spaces and places to share God's message of healing and mercy and justice and love. Not only with their words, but also with their actions. And I believe that Jesus is still sending us out today. Amen? Do you all agree? Do you agree that Jesus is still sending us out today to share that message of healing, that message of love and hope and justice and peace, all the things that Jesus represented? And the question I want us to think about briefly today is how does Jesus send us today? How does Jesus send us today? We're going to take a look at how Jesus sent his followers out way back when, almost 2,000 years ago. And then we're going to creatively try to reimagine how Jesus might be sending us out today. So our our lectionary text for today is from Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 11, and then we're going to read 16 through 20. And it'll be on the screen if you want to follow along. This is directly after our passage from last week that we talked about. So it kind of all goes together. So it says, after this, The Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. I'll just make a note. He says 72 others. He had just sent out the 12 apostles in chapter 9. Now in chapter 10, he's sending out more of them, 72 more followers. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you, listens to me, 
Whoever rejects you rejects me. Whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we're not going to get into all of what's going on. There's quite a bit happening in those verses. But I do want to talk about a good chunk of those verses this morning. So as you probably noticed, Jesus in these verses sends out 72 disciples and he sends them out in groups of two. And so he didn't want them to go all by themselves. He sends them out two by two to go out to these different towns where Jesus intended to stop along his way to Jerusalem. In the previous chapter, in chapter 9, Jesus had sent out his 12 apostles to do a very similar thing. But it's interesting now, in this chapter, he's sending out a much wider, a much diverse group of people. It's not just the chosen few that have the task to carry out Jesus' mission. He extends it out to this wide network of followers. And the question I want to ask this morning is this, how does Jesus send them out? Because he's sending them out to go carry on his mission out into all these different communities, places that they weren't necessarily from, maybe towns they've never visited. How is he sending them out into these communities? And I think this is an important question to ask for a variety of reasons. But mainly this morning, what's on my mind is that it's an important question to ask because many Christians throughout history since the beginning of the church have felt God leading them or felt sent out by God to go on missions for Jesus. And this has been happening for a very long time where people feel that God has called them to go out on some kind of mission for Jesus. Missionaries, evangelists, do-gooders, you know, have gone out to all places of the world claiming to be agents of the kingdom of God. And I'll tell you, we've seen a few wonderful examples of this throughout history where people do this in a beautiful and fruitful way. And we've seen many, many terrible examples as well. Missionaries and other Christians have been sent out to countless places across our world and tragically have often done a lot of harm. And sometimes have done a lot more harm than good, just to be honest. And I want to acknowledge a little bit of the difficulty and what's happened in the past, and then we'll talk about some good examples as well. But I'll tell you, there's been a lot of well-intentioned Christians, so you can have good intentions and actually still do harm. Y'all know that, right? We can have really good intentions. That's true for me all the time. I'm like, well, I didn't mean to do it. You're like, well, you did it, you know, and you caused harm. Christians have had really good intentions at times and, and have not always done really good work, and sometimes have done harm. Sometimes Christians have gone out to places and and they've really hurt local communities and their local economies by coming in and doing like really paternalistic and disempowering ministries. I read a story a few years back, and I think it was from the book When Helping Hurts, which is a really good kind of starter book if you want to really read about ways that Christians have kind of done harm in the name of Jesus, and often not even meaning to, but have gone out on missions and whatnot and done maybe more harm than good. I read a story in that, I think it was that book, about some Christians who wanted to help stop uh, the spread of malaria in a particular country. And, and so they realized this place didn't have a, everybody didn't have a mosquito net to kind of protect them at night. And so they went out and they said, we're going to raise money and we're going to get a bunch of mosquito nets for this community. And so they ended up, as Christians can do, we can, we can pull in the donations, right? And so they pulled in, like, so many mosquito nets. Like, so many nets. Way more than this community even needed. They took them all there, and, and they didn't need all these mosquito nets. And not, that really wasn't even the big issue. And they ended up having a plethora, overabundance. They were using them from all sorts of things. They started filling up their landfills. They ended up putting a local company who made mosquito nets out of business 
because they flooded the economy with free mosquito nets. Now, they had great intentions, right? They wanted to help, but ended up doing harm to that community without even realizing what they were doing. There are countless stories that are very similar. Church plant. I went to a church planting uh, training or workshop. It's called a church planting boot camp. Um, which is a problematic in itself, right? Boot camps are preparing people for military, for war, for battle. Church planting should not be viewed as a war or you're going into battle, just to be honest, all right? So I went to a church planting boot camp, and, and they talked about church planters. One way to do it is by parachute drop, is what they called it. Now, more military imagery here, but basically is that's when a church planter goes into a community they have no connection to, know nothing about, to go in and try to start a church there. So it's almost like, you know, you got your helicopter flying over your military plane, and they jump out as a paratrooper and descend upon this community to do battle with the unchurched people in the neighborhood, right? To bring them to his side. And, and, and it's a really interesting way of thinking about church planting. But what has happened is these parachute church plants have often negatively impacted the communities where they're started. And it doesn't take a lot of thought to realize how that could happen. Because if you're going into a community with the intention of helping a community you're not part of, you don't know anything about, then it's going to create some issues. And sometimes what's happened is they've negatively impacted the community, sped up gentrification, contributed more to these paternalistic and disempowering ways of helping people. And these are well-intentioned people that maybe have a desire to help others and spread the gospel. Now, there's been plenty of not-so-well-intentioned Christians who have done irreparable and, and just incredibly damaging things to countless individuals and communities across our world. You know, war, wars have been fought because Christians convinced themselves that God was sending them out to go build God's kingdom with swords and shields. And even more recently now with tanks and missiles and bombs and assault weapons and drones. Children have been taken from their homes by Christians. This has happened more times than we can count. Taken from their homes, put in schools by themselves, away from their families, given to other families to indoctrinate them and make them more white and more acceptable. Right here in America, Christians did that very thing to indigenous people who already lived here. Remove children from their homes, put them in other families to try to get the native out of them. This is language that was used by these missionaries. Just to be frank, I just have to say this up front, when Christians feel like they are being sent out to do something for God, it could actually be a very dangerous and harmful thing. And so we need to be very careful when we talk about this kind of thing. It's very easy for us to say, God told me to do it, or God's sending me to this thing. And often I think maybe it's something inside of us and not necessarily God speaking to us. That's why it needs to be processed in community. It really needs to be done in healthy ways because Christians have done a lot of harm. And so I want to look closely at the instructions Jesus gave to his followers. It's a good place to start, right? If we want to learn healthy ways of doing this that he gave his followers that he sent out a long time ago. And I want to focus on the two proclamations they are given to carry with them to the communities where they were sent. They were sent out with these two proclamations. First, peace to this house. So they bring a message of peace to a home, and also the kingdom of God has come near. These were the two messages that they were given. So when they arrived at a town, Jesus said, I want you to go and enter a home And I want you to say to them, peace to this house. Now right off the bat, we're coming with a message of peace. Not with a message of war or conflict. It's a message of peace. The greeting comes from the Hebrew word shalom that I've talked about more times than you probably uh, would care for here at this church. It's my favorite word in the Bible. Shalom is a blessing of wholeness. It's a blessing of peace, of freedom, of calm, of provision. To have peace is to have flourishing, to be at rest, to have everything we need to survive. And so they are to go to a house and declare their intention of bringing that kind of peace, this holistic idea of peace. I'm coming here to to be with you and to help offer rest and flourishing and, and, and concern for you and your house. This is not a conquest that many Christians have thought of themselves as on when they're doing missionary work. 
Jesus told them to stay in that house if they are peaceable people and they invite you in. So do these people promote peace? Do they seem to be people who want wholeness and freedom and rest for others? You know, I think this is a better way of judging a person when you enter their home. Um, we often look at people in very superficial ways, right? Does their house look clean? Do they dress well? Do they have good books on their shelves? Do they have good jobs? Do they have money? What does their car look like? Do they have something to offer me? Does the food smell good? Jesus tells his followers to not, don't worry about all that stuff. Are these people people of peace? Are these people concerned for others? Are they welcoming to you? Are they kind and are they loving? And he said, if they are, then stay there with them if they invite you in. And then he gave them the instructions to eat whatever they serve you. To stay in that house the whole time you were there. Now, eating whatever someone serves you, that should be kind of common sense, right? I don't know if you've ever cooked for someone and they come over and they won't eat your food. It can feel, I mean, they may have a legitimate reason, but it often feels kind of like, ah. You won't eat my food. Like, it's like kind of offensive, right? It doesn't feel good when you cook for someone and you do something for someone and they don't really want it, right? If you go to someone's home and you don't eat what they serve, it can come across as pretty disrespectful. For those of you who've maybe traveled and gone to other places and you're eating new foods that you've never seen before, it can be a challenge, right? Because you're like, I don't know if I want to eat that, right? But Jesus is saying, no, eat the food they give you. It's a sign of respect. It will be a blessing upon them. And then he instructs them to stay in that house. The first house you go to where they welcome you, stay there the entire time you're there. There could have been easily in that culture, hospitality was kind of something that was expected. And so they could go to a home and be like, oh, these people don't have a lot of money or their food's not very good or their kids are out of control. Uh, they're stressing me out. I'm going to go find another place to stay and maybe somebody else will take me in. And Jesus is like, no, no, we're not shopping around for the best place to stay in the community. First place you go to, stay with them. Get to know them. You know, maybe, maybe you'll learn something from them. Maybe you all can have a genuine moment of connection. You know, as I read through some of these instructions this week, I'm just thinking, these are like basic practices of kindness of showing respect to someone, affirming their value and their dignity. And this is how you get to know people and build relationships. You spend time eating together, talking with them, laughing with them, playing games with them, spending time with their family in their homes together. Jesus also instructs his followers to heal those who are sick in that community. Now, what does the healing of sick look like? It's more than just praying over someone. That's part of it, right? But it's also the healings in the, in the New Testament really point to God's desire to care for whole people, to see people well and taken care of. And so for us today as we're thinking about this, it's providing for people's needs. It's caring for them. If someone's sick or hurting and you have the ability to help them, Jesus is calling us to help. Now this all seems too simple to me, right? Right? But this is the truth that peace is shared through these kinds of things, through hospitality, through interdependence and relying on each other, through healing and through helping one another out. What a different way to think about ministry, particularly in our world today where it's all about having the flashy stuff and all the nice things and all the popularity and all the people. Jesus was calling them to do very different kind of stuff. What a different way to think about mission, right? Jesus' followers were sent out and called to do simple, unglamorous, loving actions for others. They were called to go into people's homes, receive their hospitality, give hospitality, share meals together, care for the sick, build community. This is the stuff of the kingdom of God. And it's through the sharing of peace in the intimate setting of home hospitality that the kingdom's nearness is experienced in our lives. This is how we experience the kingdom. He told them to tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. And they knew it had come near to them because they experienced that love and that peace and that caring and that goodness through sharing time together around tables, doing things like eating together and having fun, laughing, talking, getting to know one another. This is what Jesus called them to do. 
What are the signs of the kingdom? Well, in this passage, it's sharing food together, sick people getting well, boundaries being broken, community being formed. It's welcome, it's hospitality, it's giving, and it's receiving. Jesus warns them ahead of time that there will be some people who won't receive them. Some people won't like this. Some people won't like this coming together, this unity, this boundary breaking, this love, this healing. And Jesus told them, if they are rejected, their message still stays the same. They are to share God's peace and proclaim the kingdom of God. He told them to shake the dust off their feet and move on to a new place. This is quite the contrast to what James and John wanted to do to the Samaritan village in the chapter that comes before. The Samaritan village rejected Jesus and they wanted to call down fire from heaven and consume the people, right? But for Jesus, no, that's not what we're doing. We're not called to seek revenge or retribution. They are to share peace and proclaim the kingdom regardless. At the end of these verses, we see they return from their mission with joy. And I love that this is kind of the end of it, that they returned with joy back to Jesus. They're like, Jesus, this was awesome. Like, we experienced so much goodness. We have joy in our hearts. You know, following Jesus can be dangerous. It's costly. It's a difficult calling. Jesus told these 72 people that they were going out like lambs among the wolves. That's a very dangerous image that he's throwing out there. There will be danger. There will be challenges. But it still brought them joy. Following Jesus' call really does bring joy to our lives. And just like the 72 who were sent out back then, Jesus is still sending us today, I think, to share peace and to proclaim the kingdom of God and embody God's reign by the way we live, by the way we talk, by the way we love one another. So the question I want us to think about this morning, it's really two, is how is Jesus sending me today? And how can I share peace and proclaim God's reign with my simple words and actions this week and in the upcoming weeks and months of your life? I want to give you just a a few quick examples of how I've seen this done in my own life. I've seen it done in so many ways, but I want to just share a few examples of how I've seen others share God's peace and proclaim God's reign in ways that I think are similar to what these 72 folks did back then. Last week, I talked about my pilgrimage on the Camino de Santiago. And one day early in our journey, we met a woman named Judy. And she's the woman there in the middle um, on that photo. And one evening, uh, we were at a hostel there, and we were cooking. Uh, Audrey, who is the, the one on the, my, my right um, up there, she, she was kind of our main cook on the adventure because she she's a good cook and likes to do that. And so she was cooking dinner for us that night. And one of us, uh, I think Laura, somebody had the idea that we should invite uh, Judy, because we had met her uh, that day walking, we should invite her to share dinner with us uh, that night. And so they invited her to share a meal with us, and she ended up joining us for dinner. She ended up staying in the same hostel and slept close to us that night in the big room with all the bunk beds, and we were able to develop a pretty close connection to her. During our time together, we didn't know her very well, but we shared our stories, we shared our struggles with her. Uh, The girls ended up opening up about some past hurt in their lives, some pain that they had experienced, and, and tears were shed that night. And Judy, this woman we had never met, she, she encouraged them, she blessed them, she told them that like, she would have been just honored to be their mother because like, she just saw so many good things in their lives. Hearts were healed in that moment. And we felt the peace of God sitting around a table, sharing a meal with someone we had just met. And we felt the peace of God. We felt the kingdom of God being near. Heaven was shared that day, I do believe. I want to share another story. When I, tra- I traveled to Cambodia back in 2006. So it's an old fold of me and Laura up there. Uh, but back in 2006, I met um, many missionaries there while I was in Cambodia who were sent out by their churches and organizations to go kind of work for change in that country. And I'll say many of those missionaries um, lived in mansions, just to be honest, because you can get a house for pretty cheap there with American dollars. They lived in mansions surrounded by big walls, security guards, They rarely ate the Cambodian food and in many ways lived a life apart from the people that they were called to serve. And 
However, though, I met uh, one family in particular who I just really respected, and their names were Mark and Susan Smith, and they were there with their daughter, Soraya, who was in that photo with me and Laura. And they intentionally, they worked with this organization called Interchange, and they intentionally went and lived among the people that they were called to serve. And so they lived in a very poor community in Phnom Penh. They lived in the same homes that these folks did. They lived in their communities. They, they lived among the people. They went into their homes for meals. They played games with them. They had neighbors into their homes. They shared peace. And, and when I went into their home, I really felt God's presence. We shared a meal with them that evening, and I sensed the kingdom of God was near. Heaven was shared that day. And, and I know that they were sharing a piece of heaven with their community and their community was sharing with them because they chose to be incarnational and live with the people that God had called them to go and, and build relationships with and to learn from and also to share the gospel. Perhaps an even better example is the time that Laura and I traveled to the countryside at the end of our trip with a young Cambodian pastor. And this is a few of us that day. Um, and, and we went there, and, and they took us way out into the countryside. We met a woman who had never met an American before, and she's just like rubbing our skin and so like blown away by meeting us in that moment. And they were so kind to us. His family welcomed us into their home with open arms. They showed us such great hospitality. We went into our room, and they had like Cokes waiting for us because they heard Laura like had a Coke addiction, so they're like, we got to feed it, you know, and they Cokes, they even had this fruit called durian that smells horrendous, but, you know, they gave it to us, we're like, let's try to eat it um, in the room, and, and they just wrapped their arms around us and showed us so much love and so much hospitality. We, we went to Cambodia, in some ways, I think I thought I'd help people, they ended up helping me way more than I helped them, and their hospitality they showed to us showed us really what Jesus and the kingdom, I believe, is all about. They cooked for us. They prayed for us. They played soccer with us. They shared food and laughter and prayer. And I sensed the kingdom of God was near. Heaven was shared that day in that home out in the Cambodian countryside. I wonder if you've had moments in your life when you felt God's peace and you've sensed the nearness of the kingdom. Perhaps those moments we're with others around tables, in backyards, maybe on a journey, maybe when you're doing a task together. I'll tell you, every Monday night at the gathering, we, we get a glimpse of this. We share food around tables, we pray together, we talk, we laugh, we have a wonderful time, we worship together, we're building community. These are the simple things, I believe, that God has called us to do as His followers. In these dark times, when the dark cloud just seems to be hovering over us, Jesus is sending us out to share God's peace and to proclaim God's reign with our words and our actions. Sometimes we may be called to do something really big that gets a lot of a public attention and, and, and get accolades or whatever. Um, you know, I remember I went out, I don't go out to Wilmore too much anymore, but my alma mater, Asbury Seminary, at one point had these signs up and it said, attempt something big, and it had pictures of people that I guess they believe we're doing big things, you know, for God out in the world. And, and I think sometimes we are called to do something big, and, and we ought to attempt big things sometimes. But I tend to think that, that maybe we should focus most of our attention first and foremost on the small things, <laughs> the things that build relationships, the things that break down walls, the things that bring people together, the things that are not going to get mentioned or wrote about or you're not going to get invited to speak on or people aren't going to give you awards and accolades for doing. The things that involve sharing and mutuality and interdependence. The things that you all are doing each and every week in, in ways that I don't even know about in your lives and ways that you're reaching out to others. Because after all, that is what Jesus sent His followers to do. And I think we can learn a lot from their example. So I'll put these questions back on the screen just one more time. How is Jesus sending me today? How can I share peace and proclaim God's reign with my simple words and actions in this upcoming week? I need to get very specific and tangible about it. How are we going to try to share God's peace and proclaim that the kingdom of God is near through our simple ways of loving one another and showing hospitality and welcome and kindness um, to one another in our lives.
And y'all can think about this this morning and also throughout the rest of your week. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.